Okay, right. So um, I'm introducing myself. I'm uh, Mike Price, and um, I I'm going to be looking forward. I'm supposed to be the tail end Charlie for this session, but I'm not now today. But the, the idea was to look at what might be going on in the future and what we can learn from the past around TSRT. Um, one of the things that the image on the screen there is of TSR2 at Shoebury Ness when it has been used as a gunnery target. And one of the things that was always very striking, uh, looking at the history of some of these aircraft programmes fr from around that time, was how actually around the time TSR2 was cancelled, we became very nostalgic about aircraft. And actually, if you'd been at Shoebury Ness at that time, you'd have seen everything that you probably, if you like aeroplanes, that you love and cherish being blown to pieces and, on the gunnery ranges. So I think one of the, 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 the main thoughts I have around TSR2 is how it reflects kind of a, a love of a lost world, but the world itself was really, really heartless about this stuff. And I think that's a, an important framing because one of the things I want to do, the main thing I want to do today is actually talk to you, not as a TSR2 designer, um, I'm not quite old enough to have done that, but I have spoken to TSR2 designers and today I'll be just sort of giving you the, what one of them told me before he passed away a few years ago, um, a, a guy called Ivan Yates. And for me, I was given by Paul a, a task when he emailed me first about coming to this. I spoke at a conference about the Sands White Paper a few years ago. And Paul, uh, I've got a direct here from you, Paul, sorry. But perhaps you'll repeat your Sands lecture comment that TSR2 was a load of rubbish. And I thought, yeah, that's the way to end the TSR2 conference <laughs> with a load of people. Um, what did they ever do to you, Paul? <laughs> Why are you trying to get me to do this? Um, but what it made me think was, what did I say? Because it was an off-the-cuff passing comment. Um, I have never studied the TSR2 in particular. I've never gone to Q to find stuff about TSR2. I have been to Q a lot of times to do air, 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 um, research on the history of aircraft designs. Um, and as part of doing that, I would go and talk to aircraft designers. At Q, um, Brooklands, various other places, you kind of can't avoid TSR2. It just pops out of the files. If you're looking at combat aircraft from the 1950s, 1960s, it's there. What I was looking at was the origin of jump jets. And as part of that, I went to talk to Ivan Yates, who, where I was studying for my PhD at, the, uh, at Sussex, he lived pretty much across the road. It was one of those happy uh, uh, instances of fate where the right person is at the right place. So he used to come over and chat to me about jump jets and then we'd get into TSR2, or I'd go to his house and we'd talk about jump jets, and TSR2 would emerge. So I took masses of notes about everything he said, and delving into them is what I've done basically to prepare for this lecture today, in order to actually be able to share the thoughts of a TSR2 designer. And it's interesting, I think, is it George from Vickers, from Weybridge? Um, from the past. From the past, yes. But the, the interesting thing is, to me is, whenever you have collaborative programmes, the other guys were always the wrong ones. And my experience, uh, since doing a lot of the, this original research, I ended up working for BAE Systems. Until last July, I was working uh, on, in part, the future combat air system, so the thing that everyone refers to as Tempest. Um, but it's always the view from where you are that counts. And it, I've never really, I spoke to Spud Borer, if you knew him, many, many years ago. Um, and that's the only perspective I've got. And his main perspective was, if you know who he was, my job was to keep uh, Barnes Wallace away from everybody else. And sort of, sort of I was the in his interface with humanity. Um, so this is very much a Wharton perspective. Um, I'd be interested how it chimes with Vickers, because you'll see there's some Vickers stuff in here. But certainly, I was very struck by my knowledge of the TSR2 in the initial instance came as a kid who, like many in this room, I was interested in planes. And one day, one of my sisters shouted, Mike, Mike, come in here, come in here. So I went into the kitchen. Uh, my dad was pulling up the old uh, linoleum. And there was a picture of TSR2 when it first flew in 1964, the front page of the newspaper the next day. That's what had been shoved under the lino. And that's what was coming up. And I'd never seen it before. And what I remember thinking was, that's an odd looking plane. That doesn't look like anything I've seen before. The, how long it was. I was also very struck by, that's like the kind of plane I would draw. Long, pointy, big flames coming out the back. <laughs> and that is, TS, was TSR2 to me. And then, like a lot of people again in this room, if you know Derek Wood's project cancelled, that's kind of you know, the, the centrepiece of that book, is TSR2. And that's the story that, in some ways, I think this conference today is partly debunking. Uh, unfortunately, because of uh, family logistics, I couldn't make it to hear the earlier sessions, but I've spoken to some of the speakers just, just now to catch up on what was said. Um, but what was very striking uh, 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 is that 
that Derek Wood view of TSR2 is the great loss has started to, to be debunked. But for me, my experience of it, of it like I said, was like I read about it in Project Cancelled, and then I spoke to Ivan Yates. And what Ivan Yates had to say kind of chimed in some ways with what I had seen under the linoleum, which was, that's an odd plane. So who was Ivan Yates? Um, some of you in the room may have, may have known him. Um, but to, to me, Ivan was one of those people that the more you talked to him, the more you found out about what he'd done. And there was the headline version of what Ivan did. And as with a lot of the work in the area of secret projects, once you start digging, you tell me a little bit more about that. He'd mentioned in passing, oh, yeah, we use Turing's pilot ace computer to do... Oh, sorry, what now? Um, and you take down notes and you find out that actually who Ivan Yates was was an engineer who started working at English Electric in the early 1950s, had been put onto the, the P1 programme, and had become quite quickly world-leading expert in Flutter. Now, flutter sounds lovely, but it's actually awful. It tears aircraft apart. There were so many unknowns in the early 1950s with aircraft design um, that the, one of the great fears was that some of these combat aircraft will go into the sky and just be destroyed immediately. And they didn't understand flutter. It was the technical problem of the time. Um, jet airliners, combat aircraft, supersonic combat aircraft had to be tackled. And Ivan became the person who understood this best, partly because they used Turing's pilot ace computer to do this work, but also um, the company English Electric, a huge conglomerate, as Keith probably will have talked about earlier today, um, were able to build their own computers. So they copied the pilot ace computer that Turing had designed. The English Electric Juice was the out outcome. Um, ace Juice, that was their naming logic. And Ivan from 1955 onwards, led the laboratory where some of the first computational design of aircraft was done to try to solve uh, the flutter problem. After he'd done that work, uh, he ended up in 1959 as number two at Wharton on the TSR2 programme and actually led the Wharton team that went down to Weybridge, to the, to the, to the other side, um, to try to evolve the, the, the common design that other people will have spoken about today. And that was a painful process, I think it's, it's, it's easy to say. But after his work on the TSR2, he then led uh, Wharton's work on the Jaguar, had a large part to play in Tornado, and in many ways uh, helped create Typhoon. And I've been in touch with his son, Mark, who has reviewed these slides and had lots of discussions. He sent me lots of fascinating material. Um, and one of the things he sent me were the initial models that Ivan hand-built out of balsa wood that led to the Eurofighter Typhoon uh, 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 layout. Uh, having talked to the Germans, the P1, I think Keith you mentioned earlier. So Ivan was involved in a lot of aircraft design over a lo long period of time. But the TSR2 was something he kept coming back to every time I spoke to him about all these subjects. And then what he spoke about were the problems. So aircraft designers will all tell you, you know, they're all rubbish. All aircraft are rubbish to some extent. They're hugely compromised. But things like I was just over in the hangar looking at the TSR2, very struck by how big the cockpit is, actually. If you look at other British combat aircraft, they're kind of packed in like this. Actually, you could have you know, had a cup of tea on the side in the, in the cockpit there. So just seeing it helps. But what, what aircraft designers often will, will tell you is just, you know, R1 was the least rubbish of the lot, which is why it succeeded, rather than it was the great success. So perhaps that comment about TSR2 being rubbish is reflected in that. But the way Ivan summed up the problems that the TSR2 had came down to three essential areas, I think. One was kind of political, in the small p, and in some cases large p, was that Vickers, he, he said, just said yes to everything. Their view was, if the ministry wants it, we'll promise it, and then we'll get the contract, and then we'll work out how to do it. Um, well, cutting-edge aircraft, to be honest, if you already knew how to do it, someone else would already have the contract. So, you know, there, there is an element of having to win the work. And certainly with George Edwards' team at Vickers, the view of quite a few people I've spoken to and some Hawker Sidley people who looked into the matter could see they did high-quality work, but they had no cost control, was their view. Um, whereas Wharton believed they had great cost control, um, but actually perhaps some of Vickers' manufacturing work was higher quality than was going on at Wharton. So maybe there was a marriage to be made there. But a lot of the problems that Ivan thought that the cost of the TSR2 came down to was actually it was designed as a nuclear bomber. It's an anti-flash white title of the conference. Um, was this single nuclear mission led to great performance demands that led to high temperatures in the airframe. So Tony, I think, mentioned earlier the X2020 aluminium-lithium alloy. 
Um, the reason for choosing that was because of its ability to deal with heat, but actually it had other problems. To, uh, it was a brittle material. And those heat issues drove in huge amounts of cost. And the most striking thing that Ivan told me uh, in great detail was uh, the biggest problem was the fin was probably going to fall off. Um, because of the way it was designed, there was this real worry. And this is something that was, when you were in your room talking to him, you could see he was like, I was really terrified and concerned about this issue, that this thing would fly through the air. So there are other problems you've probably heard about today and well-known in books about the engine exploding and all this on test and concerns over uh, early flight tests with the Olympus and so on. But for Ivan, his big concern was, does the tail fin come, stay on? If it comes off, you've got an immediate crash and probably program failure. So just to dig into those problems a little bit more, um, problem one, just it's simple, Vickers, that was his view. Um, having been imported, and again, you'll have heard from, from, from other speakers today and from other sources, essentially the contract selection was made and then they were told, now go away and design something that you can do together. It wasn't the case that the, the English electric design was just built or that Vickers design was built, they had to merge their designs. But they'd already been chosen before doing that, which is one of the things that always struck me as a little bit odd. Um, it's like someone having to do some work on your house and just saying, yeah, I'll build something and then we'll figure out whether it's a kitchen or bathroom afterwards. Um, but here in this picture, I think in some, one of the ways I mentioned the fin, you can see the fin is a different colour. Um, the fin we'll mention again later. But this kind of hybrid aircraft that was put together by the two teams was actually a collaborative project. So we talk about the, the international collaboration that happened later on things like Tornado and Jaguar and so on. But this is one of the first times where two companies were told work together because it was supposed to be a welding flux, as Ivan put it, to create BAC. It was all part of, as Keith had mentioned, the industrial policy of the time to create a large civil military sector that functions by balancing work between different projects and so on, rather than having one project at a time. And what that meant is you'd have two different design teams working together. And I think it's fair to say it's easier to merge two companies than it is to merge two design teams. Um, very, very tribal. They often see the same problem very, very differently and find it hard to communicate their understanding of that to each other. And I think a lot of that, Ivan's view is in the first year, this programme was already dead. They failed to make a decent enough design. They f it just got pushed ahead because you know, the ministry needed it. Um, and as a result of that, you've got failure baked in from the start. And um, on top of the technical issues to do with that, the relationship and probably part of the cause of, the, of, of those technical issues was awful. So his view was that Wharton treat, Vickers treated Wharton like dirt, was how he put it. Just he felt like he shouldn't be there, that they knew best, they were dismissive and so on. This is a common thing in collaborative programmes. There's a lot of issues where the other guys are stupid. So later on, on Tornado, um, Wharton redid a lot of the German design work, the stressing work on the bits of fuselage, because they didn't believe that the, you know, they would have done the sums right, because Germans are famous for being imprecise. So I think sometimes it's just that, it's not quite the not invented here mentality, but it's, I, I don't get it. But no one likes to say, I don't get it. So what you say is, you've done it wrong. That's sometimes, there's a big cultural issue going on there. The speed and heat problem. Um, it was designed for worldwide use. This is one of the things, when you look at the detail of aircraft design, the temperature requirement you put on it, the, the equivalent airspeed you put on it, can drive in huge amounts of cost. And with the TSR2, when they asked, what do you want? The RAF's response was, well, what could you give us? You know, we want everything. So I, I believe from memory, it's 800 knots equivalent airspeed it was designed for. But if you're flying at Mark 1.1 at 200 feet for 200 nautical miles, your airframe is going to get very hot. And that means everything inside it expands. So you have to take into account expansion and all these sorts of things. So there's a lot of detailed work went into that. And as I mentioned earlier, and as, as Tony mentioned, the selection of expensive special alloys that turned out to be brittle and probably would have to be replaced. But equally, the flight profiles that the RAF wanted, because again, you, you may have seen profiles earlier, but you're flying at Mark 1.7 altitude, and then suddenly the charts show you're down at sea level and you're doing Mark 0.9. On, into pen, uh, on a penetration mission. And the idea is you literally, you dive. It's like a crash dive between the two. And that caused huge thermal stresses in the airframe. And this was the, the lived problem of the engineer, Ivan, working on this project, was how can you design something that actually does that? We haven't done those things before. So the, you had an airframe that had to deal with environmental criteria that no one had really tried. In some ways, more demanding. Flying fast and low is harder in some ways than flying high and fast. Um, because it it's generates huge amounts of heat. 
And one of the things they came up with, and this, the figure he put in it was nine months of delay, was just how you join two pipes inside the airframe. Um, the, 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 the brazing techniques they had to use had to be figured out. And to add to the problems, the pipes in the back of the, the, the TSR2 were double pipes. You had one pipe inside another pipe, and then you had to figure out how to braze them and make them expand at the same rate so they didn't crack. And this, this kind of small scale stuff, it seems, was actually where the cost and the delay was being driven in. But the other big problem that he talked about was the fin falling off. So this is a, a section of a rear fuselage. So you've got a bit sticking up at the top there. That's where the fin went on, the spigot the fin went on, and either side there were spigots for the, 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 the tailplanes. And the tailplanes were fine, but the fin was actually, uh, as part of the working with Vickers approach, Vickers offered to design the rear fuse, do some work on, on the, t the um, tailplanes, I think it was, on the rear fuselage. But Wharton recognised this is going to be flutter issues. So they kept the technical side while uh, Vickers did some of the sort of more detailed design side. So the calculations were being done in one place, the drawings being done in another. And the, the fin ultimately was designed, the materials for this six section fuselage and the spigot were ordered by Vickers before uh, Wharton had finished the sums on the fin. Ended up the fin needed to be bigger and it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't basically structurally uh, last very well in flutter. So if you got into flutter, the bit at the top had a fatigue life of 20 seconds, um, which is not much, you know, 3,000 hour f fatigue life. So these are the things that, that Ivan worried about. And he came up with a solution which is a hydraulic, a, 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 a double mass hydraulic damper um, that went inside the fin that raised the flutter speed from 400 knots, which is what initially it was, to about 650, but the requirement was 800. Essentially, what you had was an aeroplane that was designed to very high requirements it couldn't really meet, but had all the costs of those requirements baked in. So you were paying for something you could never realise. Um, really, TSR2 is impressive looking, and uh, you see some of the flight profiles for the missions it was going to fly down over eastern France, through, uh, over Switzerland and Austria, and up into the, the, the um, eastern European countries from unexpected directions. That's what that great circle of, uh, of range gave you. Um, what you realise is some of that performance actually wasn't needed. It was over-egged over in many ways. So Ivan, and there's Ivan uh, on uh, your left. Um, that's the end of June 1965, after it's cancelled. He looks quite happy. He's probably had a lot of burden taken off him, and he's probably just been told, you're running the Jaguar programme, so your job's safe. Some of the other lads uh, maybe haven't had the good news yet. But his basic view was it was a really bad programme, but it had some really good engineering in it. So the bits were done well. It's how the bits were put together that was the problem. And that, I think, was the main lesson that he took into future projects, the other projects that he ran. So on Jaguar, the first thing he did was he went to France 55 times in a year and learnt French because he understood already you need to be able to understand what someone is saying. We will argue over the sums but at least we have to have a common language to argue in. Um, it's also a, what he saw as a real important need. I mean essentially the Jaguar was a French concept but what Wharton brought in was the engineering depth and the ability to put cost control on this programme. So they accepted a fixed price contract and made a profit on it which, again, English Electric were a production-oriented enterprise, not the aviation arm necessarily, but the whole company was about, you make your money off production, you do design to win contracts. There's a difference between those two things. But a real lesson, I think, that he applied in the TSR2 and was happy with on the Jaguar was actually you make modest technical advances and you control the cost and the programme rather than try to make huge technological leaps and just pray to God that it's all going to work out somehow and someone will keep funding you. Um, he's in this picture, very, very small. I didn't know the size of the screen that we're looking at, but if you look at the lectern, he is third from the third right from the lectern, sitting down looking at his notes. But that's when he was, I think he was managing director of Wharton at this point. But on the tornado, again, as I mentioned earlier, what they learned was this idea that sometimes if someone's doing the sums, you might have to redo the sums yourself to understand the issue. It's not necessarily just a question of trust, it's actually understanding the issue. So when the centrifugalages came from, from Germany, um, they were rejigged in some cases to test them and all the stress calculations were redone. And what they learned is actually what looks like extra work can save you cost. So sometimes a, sti you know, a, a stitch in time saves nine. If, he'd certainly said that more than nine times to me. 
but that was his overall view, was what you need to do is understand what you're trying to do, a conscious approach to key aspects of design and technologies, know what is possible before you start making promises. That's what he really got from the TSR2 programme, don't leap into things. So on Tornado, he really applied those lessons, and Wharton at large did, and the idea was you generate data, you understand things. So um, AFVG and UKVG, which has probably been mentioned already today, the, the, the variable geometry programs at Wharton, some of the work brought by Spud Borer from Weybridge to Wharton. So there wasn't, there wasn't just a negative relationship, there were some positives flowed in. Um, that data was what they entered into the tornado negotiations. There was a lot of debate over what, what the hinge points of the wing should be. And the Germans had their view and the UK had their view. But they had the debate before it was all baked into a contract, rather than get the contract and sort it out afterwards. And the third lesson, again, this is a very happy... There's Ivan uh, standing in front of the nose of the EAP back in, I think it was 2014, when it arrived here at Cosford. Um, Ultimately, his view was you have to generate your own knowledge. You can't buy the key stuff in. People will not sell you the really important key knowledge. And the early history of Typhoon shows that, where there's a lot of, I'll call it bargaining, you could call it bickering, whatever, between uh, Wharton and MBB over what's the best layout. And ultimately, Wharton accepted the German layout if Wharton got the architecture of the avionics systems. They saw that as the, th the most important thing. Ivan had done a lot of work in the 1970s on that and saw the airframe is less important now. It's the avionics that matter. Um, but he also is quite critical in some ways of the EAP. He thought it was just uh, uh, marking time. It was about creating its own welding flux, creating time for... A, so the Germans were involved in the EAP project and then pulled out. Um, so he saw it as, well, we could have gone ahead with a flying, you know, a real service aircraft. At the time, in the early 80s, Wharton were looking at a void in production. So again, production-oriented organisation, they needed to fill their shops. They wanted to hustle, the Germans wanted to delay. Um, and what he saw is the technical aspects of that discussion are probably the most important lever you've got in order to make your partners act the way that you want to. There was, ironically, a huge debate over how many fins this aircraft should have. Should it have two or should it have one? Um, Wharton, um, if you look, have enormous fins on some of their aircraft. The, the, the Tornado, that is a Tornado fin. The Typhoon ended up with quite a large fin as well. That's a result of their work on Flutter. Um, the Germans wanted an all-moving fin like TSR2. And you can guess what Ivan's response was to that, which was probably not. So this talk, and you know, I've been queued up by a couple of previous speakers, someone's going to talk about Tempest. And it's kind of like, what can you say? What is Tempest? Well, there isn't Tempest as such. It doesn't exist yet. It's a pro, it was a team initially. Um, now it's quite possibly the name of the aircraft that the RAF might end up with, but that's not confirmed. Um, but what you have is the, the Global Combat Air Programme at the moment. You did have the Future Combat Air System. It gets very, very confusing with all the names and acronyms. Um, did anyone mention where TSR2 got its name from this morning? About, about the minister getting it wrong in Parliament. Yeah, okay. um, these programmes, you kind of think, this is all about trying to confuse ministers with no one knows what, what anything. And working on the programme, I haven't worked on it since last July, and I'm sure I wouldn't understand all the acronyms now. Um, because it's such a complex thing. What you're really doing with Tempest is building a new industry. You're not just building a new aeroplane, you're building, I mean, Wharton have not developed a new aircraft, um, if you count Typhoon, for over 30 years. Um, my argument is Wharton have never developed an aircraft of their own. Even Canberra and Lightning were imported concepts. Um, and what Wharton are doing now is developing the concepts with partners, which actually is the experience from TSR2. That's the thing to do. Develop it with them before you commit to things. Don't sort of get taken for a ride by a dominant partner when you haven't got a design in place. And part of that process is the FCAS, the Future Combat Air System uh, a Technology Initiative, which is all the bits and pieces. Again, another classic Ivan post-TSR2 lesson, which is to take all those bits and pieces of technology. So what's the best kind of engine? How do you control heat? Um, these aircraft will have a lot of uh, electronic gizmos in. I'll put it, that's, that, that's the simplest way I can put it. Um, lots of sensors, lots of uh, uh, communication equipment. Um, that all generates a huge amount of heat inside quite a constrained environment. Um, you can look at it and surmise it's probably going to be reasonably fast, so that might also generate more heat. Um, so it's understanding those sorts of issues. Again, not just saying, well, we did it in you know, 1980 and there's a report at Q that we can all go and read. Actually, you have to get the people to understand why the sums are telling you that, why we've come to that answer. 
again, it's that Ivan issue of really trying to understand the thing before you commit to it. And that's what's going on at the moment. Um, it may seem excessive to some people. You can just get on with it. Um, I was involved in writing the combat air strategy in 2018. And I think some of the discussions then were, this will be in service in 2030. Um, that hasn't happened. But I'm hoping it hasn't happened for the reason that people realise, well, we need to do some more prep before we actually commit to the thing. Because premature commitment is, the, I think, the cardinal sin in Ivan's view, and from the archives as well, with TSR2. So those two lessons kind of relate to, to, to the programmatic and the technological issues that Ivan raised, the, the problems and the lessons that he applied, learned from TSR2 and applied in other programmes. But there's one quote that I find interesting from him. I kind of, I've written a few things and annoyed quite a lot of people by saying digital isn't the answer to everything. And one of the reasons I say that is the bloke who first did digital design on Earth for combat aircraft ended up thinking, mm, maybe not. Um, and there's a quote from him. The computer is becoming a substitute for thinking. And if you go into an aircraft design office anywhere these days, what you see is a lot of people sitting in front of CAD systems, computer-aided design, and computer says yes, computer says no. Um, I haven't mentioned the Harrier so far, which is a miracle for those of you who know me. I was just taking more pictures of the Kestrel than the TSR2, because I like jump jets, as I said earlier. Um, but what you find is if you put the Harrier structure into CATIA, which is the, uh, the structural design software that virtually every company uses, it says, that's, that's impossible. That can't be built. <laughs> well... Um, it might have issues, you know, it's, it's, own, it's the best type of rubbish structure perhaps, but sometimes I think the computer aid design is looking for the mathematically perfect, but actually what's possible, there's a, there's a difference between them. And Ivan, I think you could see, he was a bit wistful sometimes when I talked to him, one of the things he said was that he thought at Wharton perhaps we just trampled all over everything, it was one of his, he ended an interview just looking out the window with the dogs, um, he had uh, several dogs, a couple of them had their heads on my lap and he kind of thought, yeah, actually, maybe we overdid it with the, with the analysis. And one of the reasons he thought was actually with computers, you can an analyze anything forever and ever and ever, and you know, maybe go to the shops and make something ultimately is the answer. And I think that digital issue is a big one. It's quite a live issue at the moment. If you've followed the Tempest uh, FCAS uh, story over the last few years, lots of people will be making promises for um, model-based systems engineering and, and, and digital twins and all this kind of thing. Complete oxymoron, a digital twin. It's a different, it's quite literally, you know, it's electrons versus physical stuff. How are they twins? Um, you see, an imaginary friend might be a, a more realistic explanation. Um, but it's a useful tool, and that's what I've found. It's a really useful tool for understanding issues, but it doesn't necessarily make the decisions for you. And if TSR2 suffered from anything, I think it was poor decision making. Lots of good engineering, as Ivan saw, put together badly. And I think digital can fool you into that. And luckily, um, just looking at uh, Twitter last night, there's a story where the Americans are building a trainer aircraft to succeed the T-38 Talon. It's called the, the, the Boeing T-7A uh, Red Hawk. Um, it's the poster child for digital design. Um, it's going to take 11 years from first flight, which was a few years ago, to entering service. They delayed it, I think, another three years yesterday. This is a trainer aircraft. The Hawk took two years from first flight, the, the Red Arrows Hawk, from two years from first flight to entering service. So I think perhaps Ivan's realisation was a, a, a true one, which is sometimes you can let the analysis and the seeming engineering progress get in the way of things. Um, but I thought, how can I test this? How could I t put, put this digital conception of everything to the test? So what's the digital flavour of the month? It's AI. Um, artificial intelligence. This is the future for everything. It's going to put everybody out of a job. I did read that we'll all be given free crisps by the government. So I thought that's not, maybe that's a good deal. Um, but I asked it, okay, we're going to a conference where the, the world's leading experts on TSR2 are going to be in a room. Um, what might they say? What do you say AI in advance? So the question I asked, this is um, the, the, the Bing, the, the AI that Microsoft have put into their uh, Bing search in, uh, uh, web browser. Um, and this is the answer. So you know, what were the three main problems faced by the cancelled TSR2 aircraft project? What I was going to talk about. An overambitious low-level supersonic range requirement. That's quite narrow. That's part of it. But that's not the whole story. There were some development issues with undercarriage and cockpit vibration. I love the vagueness of that. Some development issues. You know, BB wants eyeballs falling out of his head. Um, you know, it's, it's huge. And you saw the picture earlier of the undercarriage unit dangling down. That was probably the biggest bun fight between Vickers and, um, and Wharton, was actually, do, should the undercarriage retract forward or back? 
And ultimately, Freddie Page made the wrong decision for political purposes. I think it's one of the things that rankled for the rest of his life. Um, but also, many system elements needed development. Engine, avionics, sensors, all adding cost. Well, you could say that about anything. You could say that about a car. It's a pretty vague answer from the AI there. So, okay, well, you've identified some problems that are sort of in line, but how are you going to learn these lessons? How are you going to apply these lessons, the stuff that I'm supposed to be talking about? So I was trying to get AI to do my job for me. What are the three main lessons for future combat aircraft designers <laughs> that they can learn from the TSR2 project? I'm sorry. You have to come to the conference at Cosford because I haven't got a clue. Um, and I think that it, it, it's one of those really nice things. I was expecting something like 7,000 word essay of blah, 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 blah. I thought, there you go. It's actually, it's actually spitting out some honest, <laughs> honest view. Um, I don't know. And I would say that's probably the most important thing in aircraft design. Rather than let the computer pretend it knows something, being able as a person to say, I don't know, we've got to do something about this, is the lesson from Ivan Yates, it's the lesson from the TSR2, and it's the lesson for future projects, which is stop and think, and think about both what you've learned from the past, what you're going to do in the future, and is there any difference between them? I think for Tempest, there are broad lessons that you can gain from the TSR2. There's actually some stuff to come out of the archives about TSR2 that I know about from a day job, and I did ask, can I talk about that at a conference? And I said, no, nope, don't mention that, so I won't. But there are more things that can come out still from TSR2, I think, that can, can teach us about how to do projects in the future. But the key thing, I would say, the one thing that I've identified, the one thing to come from TSR2, which did pioneer digital design, lots of digital design, that fin design that was a problem, they used computers to the nth degree, but they made the wrong procurement decision. The people buying the bits of metal uh, got ahead of themselves, um, is digital isn't the answer. And TSR2, I think, is the poster child for, we know that lesson, we just have to find how to apply it, and the computers aren't going to tell us. So, thank you.